I went to shoot the public library and we're here as part of a joint co-host event with the Central Oregon Writers Guild. So tonight, as you can see on the screen, we have our ed agent, Ken Sherman, who is zooming in from Los Angeles. For tonight, um, Cameron Crow is our featured reader this evening. Cameron Crow has been a featured reader in Oregon and Washington since 1996. Her creative works include poetry, memoir, nonfiction, and fiction, which have appeared in regional and local publications. Her children's story, Elmer's Miracle, excuse me, Elmer's Miller, Miracles, received honorable mention in Central Oregon Writers Guild 2020 contest and was selected by Dry Canyon Arts Association for Casey Snyder's Art Education Project at St. Thomas Academy in Redmond, Oregon in 2021. Her poems, Friday Nights, Moonflowers, and Happy Birthday appear in Central Oregon Writers Guild 2022 literary collection that Mike was showing you earlier. Cameron enjoys reading, music, and building family from friends one heart at a time. Please welcome Cameron Crown. Uh, this is something I'm inspired a lot by things that happen around me. Um, and this was inspired by the death of my father in 1991. And sometime after that, I had this dream, and this is about the dream. Um, we'll get started here. It's called Passing Over. I'm walking down a long hall like those at the nursing home dad stayed in last year. Door after door, room after room, no end in sight. Suddenly, a voice I never expected to hear again hears me. I'm here. A hand beckons urgently from the corner where the hall I am in cheese into another. I take a step and pause. Hurry, not much time, the voice declares. A shadowy figure walks jerkily ahead of me down yet another long, endless hall. I follow, wondering, is it really? Oh, it can't be. And yet, that voice. The figure moves as if not quite connected to all its body parts. It rounds another corner. I increase my pace, almost running, certain I can catch up. I am standing in a short hallway, alone. A wisp of smoke curls up from a gap under a gray roll-down door. Fire! I look for an alarm, a bell, something to warn the other occupants of the building. From behind the door, I hear, you can make it, hurry. If the voice were anyone else's, I'd ignore it. But I haven't heard my father speak since my last visit to him a year ago. The need in his voice, his demand for me, is an appeal I cannot refuse. I touch the drawer gingerly, expecting to feel heat radiating through the metal. No handle mars the icy surface. I drop to the ground, push the door up high enough to scoot under it. Standing on the other side, I survey this new space. Grayish white mist snakes across the floor as if to grab my feet. Tables and chairs suggest a recreation area, but the room is empty of life. Everything is gray. The furniture appears to shift around unless I look straight at it and really concentrate. Almost like things here are real only if I believe they are. Across the room hovers a misty shape, indistinct, as if not quite materialized. Dad? I whisper, yes, yes, he interrupts in the impatient tone I know so well. <laughs> but you're supposed to be dead? I am. Then what am I doing here? I need you. What for? Energy. I breathe in short gasps as if all the oxygen has been scrubbed from the air. Nothing feels real. Perhaps I'm dreaming. Dreaming dad is still alive. Wake up. His smoker's voice is scratchy. Dad, I don't understand. How can I help if you're already dead? Got a problem. Can't go. Next place without you. 
Again, my attention wanders. I have waited all my life for dad to speak to me, for more, need me for more than an extra pair of hands. Now that he's dead, he is dead, isn't he? Yes, I saw him in his coffin at the memorial service. How can he be talking to me now? Pay attention. I look up. While I have been following the memory trail to assure myself that dad is indeed dead, the figure across the room has faded even more. His husky voice, though fainter, is oddly compelling. I want him to keep talking to me, dream or not. What do you want me to do? Get who Lumi best. Who? Your mom. Her thoughts strong. Your energy. Hers. She won't listen to me. Without her, you, I'm stuck. His tone commands me as always. I turn to go, then turn back. How do I contact you again? I'll know. Well, watch come where you are. Rolling back under the metal door, I notice the walls are now the featureless green I remember. An efficient color, the face little with multiple cleanings. Voices and the screech of chairs being dragged over the vinyl floor surround me, sounds of life. Retracing my steps, I rehearse what to say to mother. She won't believe me, no matter what explanation I give. She's heading south this afternoon to visit her favorite daughter and two little girls in Ashland who adore their grandmother. Mother and I have never been close. What can I say to persuade her to help dad? Driving west over the Cascade Mountains to mother's apartment in Salem, I ponder what kind of energy one can give a person who is dead. It doesn't seem feasible. Anything physical can pass between us. Thank you, Cameron. All right. Uh, and as Mary said, if you would like to be a featured reader, Mary, raise your hand again. Mary. Oh, I'm sorry. Hand. Yeah, that's the person you're talking to. All right, we're going to get on to our presenter here. Uh, Ken Sherman is joining us from, um, from Los Angeles. Ken is the president of Ken Sherman and Associates. Uh, he's been an agent for more than 20 years. He's accumulated an impressive list of clients, including notable names such as David Cooterson, Ann Perry, Franz Kafka, Robert Kaffner, John Updike, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Star Talk. He has taught and lectured extensively at venues including UCLA, USC, Loyola Marymount University, both in New Orleans and Los Angeles. The Santa Barbara's Writers Conference, the American Film Institute, San Francisco Writers Conference, Hawaii Writers Conference, Kauai Writers Conference, University of Oklahoma, Santa Fe Writers Conference, La Jolla Writers Conference, Novelists Incorporated Conference in San Diego, Chautauqua Institute, the Aspen Institute, Aspen Summer Words Writers Conference, and the Eugene International Film Festival, where he received a Lifetime Achievement Award. Sounds like Ken is just moving around the country all the time. Um, and so without further ado, Ken's going to tell us a little bit about life as an agent. So welcome. Well, thank you. And it's very nice to be with all of you tonight. Um, I've been doing this for a while. Uh, words that may come out of my mouth tonight will just be an, a, the mouth of an opinion maker, an, opinion, an opinionated person. Let me take it, put it that way. I have my own thoughts. You may not agree with anything I'm going to say tonight, but I hope we can just keep a dialogue going and just have some fun and talk about um, basically I think tonight would be, you know, for me, what is a writer? What am I looking for as an agent? Uh, and I'll just sort of jump into this. And please, I'll just gab for just a few minutes, but I think your questions will be more interesting in terms of how I can respond. Um, I represent book writers of fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I represent screenwriters. I'm always looking for new projects, new writers, basically, 
who are writing projects that could be made into a film or a television series or a TV movie or a feature uh, that's a film. Uh, and th those things are very uh, subjective. I have my own taste. I, that's one of the reasons I have my own company so that I can choose who I wish to work with. Uh, but that just comes with time. Um, I'm looking for writers who are obsessed with their writing, writers who are not just working on the weekend, maybe for a few hours, but who are working every day. They're stealing time from their day jobs or their family lives to write what they feel passionate about, what, what they have a, a, an obsession with. Uh, I'm looking at some notes I've written here, but I think I'll throw those out and just gab away here. Uh, to me, a writer that I'm interested in, and this is just my opinion, because I'm sure you'll have other writers, uh, other agents who uh, will have other opinions, but somebody who is passionate, cares about their characters, fiction and nonfiction, I believe, Nonfiction, you're still are writing about people or the way people think or the way people can do, people who can uh, help you with your life, but who are passionate about their writing. And I've found the authors that I'm most attracted to are ones who get up at five in the morning before they have to leave for their job job at seven in the morning or eight in the morning. And they put in a couple of hours. And sometimes it's sitting at your desk, which can be a computer or a legal pad or whatever. And sometimes things just flow. They just flow. You're just, you're just opening the, the floodgate of your, of your excitement and your, your, your love of this or that character, this or that story. Don't forget you're all storytellers and you want us to you want to bring us into as a, a potential agent into your world. And it's a fantasy world. Everything is fantasy. Fiction and nonfiction, even nonfiction can be a lot of fantasy because you have a point of view about this or that. Uh, but I'm finding more with fiction that I want to get into your head. I want you to write about, I want to see, hear you on the page writing about those things you're not supposed to talk about, let alone have lived or fantasized about. That's going to make it, for me, really interesting so that I can call a potential uh, editor at a publishing house or again, coming back to the film or TV possibilities, a producer and say, this is different. This is different. This, this has a life of its own, a storytelling ability. I'm, I'm a real believer and lover of good characters. Um, is it the Fablemans that Steven Spielberg just made a movie of? It's supposed to be about his his life, his growing up. I thought it was pretty tepid. I thought I thought he really uh, sort of short sheeted us by not really going in. I think he was afraid of being too negative up, too negative, but maybe too naked up on that screen with his characters because he co-wrote it with a great playwright. And by the way, very often. Once you have written your book and it's potentially available for me to take it into the marketplace, I have to keep in mind that when I contact an editor or a producer or a network or whoever, that I may be one of five or 10 agents who will contact them that day and I will pitch my story. And it has to just really sing. And that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, don't be afraid 
of your excitement about writing. Because if you don't have the excitement, it's not going to happen. It's not simply not going to happen. But but have fun with it. Don't be afraid of it, but commit to it. Like any relationship, it is a relationship with you and your characters and your story. Uh, one of my clients is Ann Perry, who I think it's, I handled her for film and TV rights. She has about 100 books out. But as we were talking a few days ago, she said, don't forget, Ken, I didn't start having a writer's career, meaning making money at this fantasy of mine that I could actually tell a good story and people would be excited to hear it, hear them, read them, until I was 40 years old. She was working as a, as working at the Beverly Hills Hotel, uh, getting the car park guys, getting their cars. She was behind the scenes. So, you know, there, there are no rules. There are no rules other than, I think, writing obsessively because it's not, I keep, I'll keep saying this, I don't feel it's gonna happen unless you can find the guts to make that commitment. Because I think I can tell when I'm reading the first two or three or 12 pages of your manuscript, if you've really worked at it, maybe worked with, and I know you have discussion groups, uh, reading groups, uh, keep an open mind, face rejection head on. That's a tough one. You know, your best friend may read it and say, uh, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. They may not know how to read. They may not know how to get into your head. You may not have presented it in a way that your best friend can read it. I think those are not the people to go to, though you will, because you're proud of your work and be prideful about it and work possibly with a private book editor. Sometimes they cost money. Sometimes they aren't terribly expensive, but you need to make a financial commitment. Uh, to me, there are two parts of being a writer. And can look at it from this way. It's the writer's business. It's a writing business. So you write your material, and then you take on the second hat of learning how to work professionally with agents, editors, um, hopefully producers. But but just go for it. I think I'm doing a little bit of ramble here. Um, yeah. You know, what do you do to, to impress an agent, which is something that was brought forth in this conversation, or, you know, as, as part of this? Um, to me, it's reading something that is fresh, is, is developed. Uh, when you get feedback, sometimes, uh, you will get words that you don't want to hear. But keep it, try to keep an open mind after you feel the, the, the twang of, oh my gosh, they hate my work. I'm horrible. I'm never, I'm never going to, I'm going to abandon myself. I'm going to abandon myself as a writer. Don't do that. But if you have the passion for it, you will keep at it. I, I, I've worked for many years, I did work for many years with, with actors, as well as directors and producers. And actors can go out on um, interview after interview and be turned down. They don't look the way the producer wants them to look. They don't sound the way they're supposed to sound. They don't move properly. I was listening to an interview I think on Jay Leno of the guy who plays Elvis in the new Elvis movie, which is very interesting, whether you like it or not. It's certainly audacious. The director has taken chances and that's what I'm looking for. But why, do, why don't we open this for questions now uh, and go from there? Share if those ones you see here. Oh, 
I, I can't hear you. Hi, my name's Ken. Can you see me? No, but I'll try. Let me see. Yes, there we are. Hi, my name's Ken as well. Um, you talked about you're looking for something that's fresh, and I don't know what really that means. Is that uh, contemporary or, you know, I can see, uh, you know, when Herman Melville took Moby Dick to his agent, was his agent looking for fresh? And would that have been something fresh for his time? Can you? I, I, I think it. I think, I think, <clears throat> excuse me. I think fresh to me is simply something that I start reading and I can't put it down. And that's totally subjective. I remember um, one of my clients years ago had written a series of books that were internationally acclaimed. And we had, I had taken it into uh, a producer who took it to NBC. They attached a writer to it to adapt it for a six hour mini series. And I knew the books, but I was fearful that there was no way to translate them into a mini series. And I knew the adapter of the books who was going to write the six hours and I got a call from the network who said we're sending you the six hours and hopefully you'll read them and will love them as much as we do and I was I sort of not groaned I knew it was a responsibility for me to read them and they arrived by messenger about six o'clock at night. And I looked at them and I said, don't start reading at night. Start reading early in the morning. And I said, OK, I'm going to read the first two hours in the morning. I'll read the next two hours in the evening. And then I'll read the last two scripts in the afternoon on, for, on Sunday morning. And. I started reading them about six in the morning because in a way I was excited to read them. I, by the way, I'm excited to read any new material because I'm always hopeful that I will personally respond to it. And the next thing I knew, I started at six. It was about 11 or 12 o'clock noon. I couldn't put them down. That's what new means to me. It could be mean. It could be a World War II story. It could be um, a Viking story. Uh, so it doesn't have to do with the time that it's set. But it's just that if I can't put it down, that's a sign to me that it's new and it's fresh. Does that make any sense? What does the writer do to grab you and hold your attention? just exactly what I'm talking about, uh, that I can't put it down, that, that I respond well to the characters, that I respond well to the story. I don't know how you can separate the two. I respond in a way that, boy, how is this character who's being challenged by the gods going to survive and is he or she going to uh, win? Those are the things, these are sort of classic things. Uh, it's hard to describe that. You know, what, what do you like when you, when you, do you like chocolate ice cream? Do you like pistachio? Do you like vanilla? Or do you like a chocolate sundae or, or a coffee ice cream with chocolate syrup on the top? That's my favorite, hot fudge. You know, it's totally subjective, it's totally subjective. You're welcome. Hello, can you Hello. hear? Uh, I'm Lynette, and is it? I have like, like three questions. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Go for it, Lynette. Please right. start the first one. 
okay, like, as I've heard this term many times, I, and I kind of looked into it, but I'm not. I'm sorry, but I can't really hear you. I'm not quite certain what a platform is. A platform to me is what I, it's really your bio. It's, it's, show, it's showing an editor or a producer that this is your background. Ideally a platform, um, especially with nonfiction, is um, <clears throat> that you've lectured a lot, that you have a following online, um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. I, I think that will come with time. I think the most important thing is for you to write your book, to write the, your fiction or your nonfiction material. But a platform is showing the editor that people already know who you are because people love to take on material that other people have already said or an author that other people have already said, this is a good writer takes a little bit of the onus off of them if they put their butt on the line and say to their publishing house, I like this work. I like this writer. We should take this book on. All right. Um, what would you use in a, a query letter? Query letters. Okay, this is really interesting. <laughs> Your query letter is like the elevator pitch, or it's like that pitch when you have 30 seconds or a minute when you go to a writer's conference and you're in front of an agent or a producer or an editor at a publishing house and you're terrified and you're in a line of 10 people and you're allowed three minutes and you're supposed to tell them what your story is and you're shaking and you are a very established attorney or a great mother, or a great whatever, and you're supposed to pitch your story in a minute. And my thought is, if you really know what your story is about, you can pitch in a way to your person, whoever you're pitching to, that story in a one-page written pitch. It's the same thing, written or verbal. Uh, but it, it, that's, I'm sorry, I've lost exactly what you were asking, but does that make sense to you? You need to know your material so that I go, hey, that's really interesting. May I see the pages? And that one page synopsis that I can send to an editor and they say, hey, I wanna see that. That's really interesting. This has a life of its own. Writer, can you say talking to the microphone more please what stories do screenwriters and directors like uh, uh like anything from uh, beginning directors to like uh, the big names like a uh, steven spielberg or um, christopher nolan names like that well, it would be nice, you know, don't forget, just like every well-known author you know or director or screenwriter started from nowhere, just like you're doing, just like you're doing. You start, you start at the beginning and you, and you take that passion, you take that obsession, because I'm going to say it again, if you're not obsessed quietly, quietly about your writing, it's not going to work. But each successful director has read a script that they've had an opportunity to direct because they've had a passionate response to it. And so you can't, I can't tell you what Steven Spielberg is going to like. I thought his movie was tepid. I thought he, I thought he, I'm going to say it again, sort of short sheeted his, himself. I thought it was sort of boring until about the last quarter. Uh, you don't have to agree with me, uh, but I need to be able to take material to young 
uh, producers, directors, editors. I'm looking for somebody new and fresh and someone who is a good storyteller, who is excited about their writing because it comes through the passion. And again, I'm gonna say, write about things in a way that you're not supposed to express yourself or to know about or to have experienced. Put your butt on the line and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because you'll bring yourselves up together with the other writers in your group. And then when you have an, edit, an agent who feels passionate about you, he or she may say, let's take this to so-and-so. And they go, wow, where to find this, Ken? And don't forget, you are my reputation. That's a challenge because I can't afford because of my reputation to take material out that's half-baked, that's been fearfully neutralized because you haven't been afraid to really write those characters who are daring and frightening and fun. Have fun with it, by the way. I think it's a good thing to always overwrite, overwrite. Take each character in your story and write a, write a short story about them. And then write about the room that they're in. I could write a whole short story about the room I'm seeing behind you. And I could write one about the lights. And I could write, write one about you, who I don't know, but I could have ideas. And then eventually you're gonna say, now I know what I wanna write. Now I know the story. And don't forget also, that very often writers get to the end of their first draft and they say, oh my gosh, the story is not about her. It's about him. That's who the story is really about. So you hone and hone and hone and revise and revise. It doesn't happen overnight. Hopefully that answers a bit of your question. You're looking for, you're looking for answers. There are no answers. There are no rules. Things either work or they don't for an editor, an agent, or whoever. I understand. Mm -hmm. right, Thank you. Ken, I'm going to ask you some questions that are on uh, <clears throat> in the chat here. Um, uh, and I'll try and sort of uh, consolidate them. So some of these are about pitches. Um, and I don't know if you take sort of verbal pitches like they do at some of the writer conferences, or if you're uh, entirely, uh, if things come to you uh, via email. But um, one question is, uh, if you hear a pitch, would you want the author to stick to the storyline or grab you with a series of hook? Um, another question is, you've mentioned that the writer needs to know their material um, and they want a little bit more detail on, on what does it mean to know your material and, and, and just in general, how do you like to be approached by a writer? Well, that's a lot. Uh, I was trying to get I, I go to many conferences and I'll sit at a table. And there will be writers who will pitch to me. <clears throat> and I've usually found the ones who are most nervous to have the best stories because they really care about what they're writing. And I want to hear the story. I want to hear the characters. I ideally would like to hear it in 30 seconds or a minute, but you've You've really honed your story and can pitch it to me in a way that I'll say, hey, that's really interesting. I want to hear more about this. Let's talk after the pitch session now. And for the next two hours, I can ask you questions and you can answer questions about each character, each storyline, about the conflict, because you know your material. And I keep repeating this, I know. You're intimately involved with them, with it, because you you love your characters, even the bad ones. Those are always the most interesting, mostly. 
for me. Um, there are no rules. It, you know, it, it, it's a pitch. Uh, I think I'm losing exactly all the, the three areas you were going in. Um, but I want, I want to hear your excitement about it. I want to be able to leave the day's conference or when we all sit at dinner or at a bar or something and talk about it. I want to say, you know, that really has stuck in my mind. Because don't forget, I need to pitch whatever you pitch to me or whatever I read on your pages to a book editor or to a producer. So unless I have it clearly focused in my mind, I'm not going to do a very good job pitching your idea because I pitch it and hopefully the editor says, hey, I'd like to see that. That's what I'm looking for. And so I send the material to the editor or the producer and they call and they say, hey, this is really great. I, I think I'd like to do it, but I need to take it to my colleagues because in each publishing house, there might be three or four agents in a particular area who deal with a particular type of fiction or nonfiction. And they go to their Friday morning early breakfast meeting, like at seven o'clock or at eight o'clock before the place opens, and they pitch it to each other. And the editor I've taken it to says, hey, guys, I want you to read this. And they say, hey, that's really interesting. I'd like to read that. So he sends it electronically to each of them. But then each of those writers has the same spiel to the rest of his colleagues and says, I'd like. So suddenly the editor who's go is going home on a Saturday with four or five books to read and to come back on Monday to their early morning meeting. By the way, it used to be lox, cream cheese, and bagels. Now it's usually just bagels and cream cheese because lox is too expensive. Everybody's holding back. And by the way, that is, that's a reflection also on what it costs to edit a book, for an editor to take their time to read it and to edit it and to help you make it better. And so then hopefully they all say, we love this. And then the editor says, great, thank you all. And then he has to take it to their lead guy at the publishing house. See, isn't it making you crazy that so many people have to make a decision on your baby? I'm sorry, my baby is beautiful and everyone else's is ugly. You know, that, that's sort of what goes on, but that, that's part of the process. So presenting yourself to an agent at a publishing, at a, at, a, at a writer's conference, be nicely dressed or as nicely as you can be. Realize that we're there looking for good writers. I'm looking always for a writer that I can have a long relationship with, um, such as example, David Gooderson. David and I have been working together for years. Again, I handle him for film and TV. And um, he's written many books. We've had options. Did you ever read Snow Falling on Cedars? If you haven't, please write it down. Just read it as an example of a writer who, this was his first novel. His book editors, who I work hand in hand with in New York, took it to his publishing house. He got a very modest advance on it, but it's, it's, beautifully written, Snow Falling on Cedars, David Gooderson. I hope you're all writing this down if you haven't already read it. And it became an international bestseller and it, showed, it sold three or four million copies, which gave him a financial buffer. Finance is behind you. You, you, can't, you can't let your lack of financial security stop you from writing what you passionately want to write about. Did I answer your, some of your questions there? I think so. Who's, come on up, anybody.
Ken, thanks for being here tonight. My name you're is welcome. Peter. And you, you're talking about accepting clients' um, work that you're, you can see that you're passionate, they're passionate about, and you're passionate about. What happens when somebody brings you their beautiful baby and you believe it's a beautiful baby, but the editors that you're presenting it to see it as ugly? <laughs> I move on. I move on to the next editor. Because if I believe in it, I believe I can sell it. If, if I don't believe in it, you don't want me as your agent. I'm not going to do a good job for you. But if, you know, very often, what was it? All the Harry Potter books had like 23 turndowns before the editor who picked them up said, this is very special. And look what happened. There are billionaires in that thing. It's more than just being a billionaire. It's being excited about it. And if I feel passionate about something, I'm not going to stop sending it out. I will continue working for you that way. Ever had a piece that was not picked up? I can't hear you there. Can you talk more to the microphone? Sure. Have you ever had a piece that was not picked up by an editor that you presented? Abs absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Maybe I, I have no taste in terms of what might be commercial, because we're always looking for commercial. I have a client who's written 23 Christmas novellas. And I found two producers who want to work together to take them into the marketplace. But are we going to be able to sell them? We don't know. So I just have to persist and, and go with my own taste. That's very arrogant, isn't it? No, it's it's just it's what makes me me and allows the door to stay open for when I go to, to editors or producers or whoever. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, I'm Deb. How do you perceive cancel culture working with writers right now? What is cancel culture? That people find it offensive and so they won't read it. And I'm not talking about using inappropriate language that we all know you don't use inappropriate words. I just mean that if you're, I, I write suspense for one thing, and there may be some scenes in it that are found to be really graphic. Good. And so someone will say, I am so offended by how graphic that is because you don't understand you haven't been in this situation. They don't know whether or not I've been in that situation, but because they find it offensive, or the agent finds it offensive, they reject it. So you're being canceled. Do you? Well, okay. You know what? What, what I want to say is, you need to, on one level, face rejection head on. You know, if they don't get it, they don't get it. And if they're offended by it, um, gee, that's too bad. Uh, it, if it, if it works within the context of what your story is and what your characters are about, uh, that's part of it. Uh, there's a movie that just came out, and I keep forgetting the name of it, that has had scathing reviews. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of it. It just, it's raw. It's raw. And the characters are raw. And the filmmaker has taken chances. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm hoping I will find. Uh, there are a lot of prudes out there who, who, are offended because they've never thought about the things you've thought about or experienced personally or imagined. Everything's fiction. Everything you write is fiction. This is You're writing about people who were never on those pages before, who never had a life until you've given them life, until you've given them 
a reason to be there and to be in conflict and to, to almost get killed or almost to not be able to handle a relationship, a marriage or personal or whatever. So good for you for writing that way. And if you're finding agents, you know, are offended by it, then you need to find a different agent, potential agent. But writing raw is okay, even though there is no, there is no okay. There is the way you write. You know, I'm going to say something that hopefully will not offend everybody, but use the word fuck them if they don't get it. Just the hell with it. I like you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who else? Why not? Uh, Ken, we've got a question. Um, do you prefer to interact with writers at conferences or do you work primarily via email? How, how do you get your submissions? Uh, both, both. I love going to conferences because it gets me out of my office, out of my home. I'm working from home as I have. I had my own office for 25 years in a wonderful building. It was called the Writers and Artists Building. It was built by Charlie Chaplin, Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, and D.W. Griffith when they formed United Artists. And it was filled with writers. And I was amazed that they let me into the building. Um, but I, I love one-on-one -on -one contact. And yet, very often, the way I today, particularly, uh, encounter new writers is through friends or other writers that I know, clients or non-clients, um, at a party, I'll meet, you know, or at a dinner, uh, I'll, I'll meet a, a writer. So I'm totally open and I really enjoy conferences because it's just fun. And I have to go to ground zero and I have to think about why am I there? Am I connecting with the writers who are there? Are they connecting with me? Um, and I have my own tastes. Just as you will, you know, you might meet me and talk to me for a while and say, Ken's not my, I don't want him for an agent, but I promise you the first agent who offers you a uh, representation, you're gonna take it, most likely. Hi, Ken. Trish here. I actually have a friend over there who has laryngitis. So she asked me to ask this question for you. She typed it up on her phone. <laughs> she says, I lost my identical twin sister in 2021 suddenly. For our birthday, I wanted to do something special for her. I was, I was woken up at 2.30 in the morning with lines filling my head from her and God. A year and 115 poems later, I have helped myself through my grief. I now want to publish to help others also. So her question is, do you know how to find an editor or agent or whatever who is a twin who might understand what that might be like? Like there are twin um, Facebook groups and you know various things that have thousands of followers and whatnot. And she's wondering, how do you find an agent that might be interested in that kind of particular thing? Well, I would say that that's a fantasy about how, that's one way to go about selling it. Has she completed the manuscript? Yes, right? Yes. Has it been worked over by a private editor? Not yet, no. I, I, would, rec I would recommend that. I think the idea of going to an editor at a publishing house who's a twin is a long shot to find that. I can't go and ask every editor, are you a twin? You know, one of a twin. Uh, but if the work works on the page, if I sit up and say, wow, this is really good. I want to send this to X or Y editor because I think they will respond to this story. That's the way to approach it. But it sounds like from what you read to me that it might need 
a private editor going through to work through the dialogue, to work through the, the wording. But I but I I don't know, I could be wrong. There, there, there are types of editors. There are the editors at publishing houses, but I very often when I see a spark that I respond to, I'll say to an to a writer, how about working with a private editor? And I can recommend two or three different ones. So, so you're saying go to an editor first, polish it as much as possible, and then look up agents that are maybe interested in poetry or like would yeah. they be testing that? Look, look up, look up at agents who have writers who you feel simpatico with, or you feel you're like their their agent, their writers who have already taken on a, a, a mystery writer or a nonfiction writer. You know, so sometimes, again, I would say there are no rules. You, you just never know. But uh, do some investigating. Back, back to the idea of a query letter. Some people spend hours and money sending out armloads of query letters. Many agents I know will not even read a query letter. Or if they, if you're going to do that, find their ideal, find their email address if you can. And don't say, hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a really terrific writer living in wherever. And I'd like to say, dear Mr. or Mrs. Not, to whom may, it may concern. My story is about and you write about you give their what you give that half page or that one page killer synopsis or teaser of what your book is about fiction or nonfiction and then they say because i get many of those in and rarely have i found anything that way usually i find them at conferences or through other friends through other writers friends and otherwise, clients and otherwise. Uh, but again, that's polishing first the book and secondly, polishing that one page synopsis, that query letter, which is that one pager. And going to conferences, <laughs> right? So, well, that's how we met, go to yeah. conferences. And and boy, they're 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 crazy. You know, you're sitting at, at the bar or you're having lunch or dinner with somebody and you hit it off and you say, What the hell am I doing here? And what was that all about? And I'm totally overloaded and I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and I need some guidance. And great, you go for it. I recommend everybody go to every conference you can. It's expensive if you have to travel and have a, a hotel room and, and feed yourself. And But try it and see what other people are doing. Hear what other agents have to say. Hear what editors have to say. I promise you, if you've gone to two seminars in the morning, you're not gonna be well focused in the afternoon. It, it's just, there's too much information. But find what works for you. I want to go again and say all of that is the next step after you have written your book. You must write your book. You must polish it. You must do draft after draft. You must take all that rejection because people say, I don't get that character. I don't get that story. That's stupid. You know, but that's maybe a defensive mechanism on the part of the reader who is part of your reader's group. Be careful of your reader's group, of people who might be jealous of your high quality writing compared to theirs. And they might consciously or unconsciously deep six you. But if you don't believe in your work, you can't make me or the editors or the publishing people after the book is up, get excited about it. Now she wants to know, how do you edit divine words from you that have come to you from God? 
Well, I'm an atheist, so I don't know. <laughs> okay, then. Um, basically, these poems came to her like at night, would wake her up, she'd get up, she'd be hearing them and write them down. And write them never, down. Write them down. down. She did. Write them down. See what you have. See how they hook together. See what the story is. Tell your story based on these 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 words you're hearing in your brain that wake you up in the morning. I do that. <laughs> and you know what I do with my, that, that I'm not going to say craziness, that stuff that you just can't control because it's just there. I rented a, a one car garage in old Hollywood here in LA. This missing <laughs> And I go in and I took everything out of it. And I put, put plywood on the walls and I stick pin paper on it, and I have charcoal and acrylics, and I go there and I can be sloppy, be sloppy as a writer. You don't have to find every word, you don't have to find every phrase, every every sentence. And I can slop and I get dirty in, the, in my clothes. You know, I have clothes that I work in when I go to my studio, and I maybe do, 20 or 50 or 100 drawings. And out of those drawings, maybe two or three are ones that I care to show to my friends, let alone the so-called public. So I'm saying, don't worry too much. Just do it. If you're not writing it, it ain't going to happen. I sound like a, I don't know what I sound like. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. All right, I got some more uh, online questions for you here, Ken. Good. Uh, Liza is asking um, that she's heard from uh, taking courses that they suggest to make lists of agents who are potentially a good fit for our work, but to refine the materials through a few rounds of submissions with other agents before contacting the top agents. What do you think of that idea? That's assuming that the agents that you're referring to before the top agent in your fantasy list have turned you down. Yeah. If they've turned you down, see if you can get reasons for the turn down. And I'm a real believer if two people comment about something that is one of the reasons they've turned it down, you have a theme going and you need to observe that and you need to think about it and see how it responds, how you respond, how it doesn't make sense for what you've written. So do you, do you think um, when you get that rejection that says, I'm that sort of form letter rejection that says uh, your, your work doesn't fit into our portfolio at this time, best of luck with so on and so forth, should, we, should you contact that agent and say why? Well, ideally, yeah, ideally, if they're going to do that. But most agents I know don't have the time to be a, you know, an editor for you to give you their reason list of why it's a pass. And then you just need to move on. But maybe you can. You can just say, oh, Mr. and Ms. So-and-so, thanks for your pass on my material. You have one or two thoughts you can give me to help me make it better. Okay. They may just not have gotten it. Um, they may just not have understood what you're writing. Another question from Becca. How do you know if you found the right agent? You probably will know it in your gut. I'm going to say again, chances are the first agent who says yes to your representation is who you're going to go to. But ask them questions. What do you think about this work? Does this really, why, why, if you, why do you want to work with me? I want to work with you, but why do you want to work with me? And then, then you're going to find out if they really understand your work. All right. Uh, question from Andy. Um, you, can you work with both um, film and uh, books, right? Correct. Is there, do, you, do, you, do you think that uh, TV film pro developers, producers, look for something different than a print editor or do you how do you how do you approach that well i i'm going to say again i approach it that 
when I take on a writer and when I take on a book, I'm always looking for the film and TV possibilities. Uh, I'm sorry, would you say the question again? I'm sorry, you've gone mute. I think you've answered it, but um, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. I think you've answered it, but do you look for anything different between uh, a print book and a what you would think potentially would be a film or, or TV series? It's a gut feeling. It's a gut reaction. If I've read something, I say, hey, this would make a great movie. Or this, you know, this seems like what people are looking for now. Uh, I have a series of books that the, it, this is going to sound very simplistic. The lead character is a woman. It's a World War II story, Nazis and, and not Nazis. And the, the lead lady, I'm going out looking for the right actress. And I'm hoping that we're going to find her. She's going to say, wow, I want to play that character. I sold a book to, to uh, Paramount Television, meaning it's in development now, where the, the story is just absolutely wonderful. And I took it to a producer who took it to a, produ a, pr a private producer who took it to a producer at Paramount, who took it to one of their actresses who's under contract, who said, I want to be the mother. That's the lead. And therefore, we immediately had a deal on it, meaning it's being developed. So that's what you look for and hope for. All right, one more question from our uh, Zoom audience. Uh, I find more often when I pitch that agents are looking more for own voices. How do you feel about that movement? Do you find authors qualified to write about anything they want? I think everyone should write about anything they want because they feel passionate about it and they make it their own. What was the first part of the question? Because there, there's... Uh, the, it, it seems that a lot of um, agents are, are specifically saying we're looking for what, are, what this person is calling own voices. And I'm assuming that's the LGBT, BIPOC, um, uh, uh, marginalized voices. Um, how do you feel about that movement? I think that's maybe one way of looking at it. To me, your own voice is that you are a writer who has learned to write and has something that has drawn me into it, into your storytelling, so that I can't put it down. Like I was saying uh, with those six uh, hours of television for NBC, uh, I couldn't put it down. That's that's the voice. Uh, you know, the LGBT or the the trans or whatever things. Those those are things that are important. There's some wonderful projects being done in those areas. And if you know about those, write about them because your experience is going to make me sit up and say, "Wow, this lady or this gentleman knows this material." knows the characters they they have a there's a life to it this is something i think i've been saying all evening you know write about what you care about and maybe what you know about and if you don't know about it fantasize about it and it may take on a life of its own but there are no rules you know you're looking for rules here there there are no rules And so should we just send all of our um, manuscripts to you directly now? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That's a joke. Did we send all of our manuscripts directly to you? No. No. You need to go through you and you need to, to be a clearinghouse for me. All right. <laughs> All right, um, I think, does anyone have another question? Yeah, come on up. I'm gonna scoot up close. Hi, my name is Janet. I am brand new in the world of writing, primarily nonfiction. 
And I was wondering, in, in your experience, have you ever noticed trends in what the public seems to be drawn to regarding what sells, what seems to be more marketable? I, I think that's a really good question. I think by the time I can say, ooh, there's a trend here, or an editor at a publishing house says, there's a trend, usually the trend has been saturated behind the scenes with material. So I think there's a danger in looking for a trend because by the time you write that book that you think is something that is, a, is, a, is part of a trend right now, um, chances are by the time you finish your book, which could be a year or two later, that trend is passed. Or if you've written something, pardon me, that is so good, possibly it will sell. But I think it's a danger writing for a trend. I, I again, please write something that you feel passionate about, that you care about, fiction or nonfiction. And sometimes the title will do it. Uh, I have a client, Amy Alcon, who's had a wonderful platform. She has had her own blog and enormous following nonfiction. Uh, and I met her. She was introduced to me by a mutual friend at the uh, UCLA Festival of Books. It takes place now on the USC campus. And our mutual friend uh, said, you really need to talk to Amy. She has a great story. She has a great nonfiction book that's really good because she had read it because she knows she shouldn't tout things that she doesn't believe in. That doesn't, that's like 10% people will do that. And the rest, you know, do the Velcro thing, throw 10 pieces on a wall. And if two or three set stick, they'll go for it. And I met Amy and she's dynamic and a little crazy. A little crazy is always great. You know, that's something that I think means that they're, you know, it's, it's an individual. And she pitched me the story. And she said, you want to know the title? This is a nonfiction book. I said, yeah, this is something that all agents and editors look for. And I said, what, what's your title? And she said, good manners for nice people who sometimes say fuck. <laughs> and you know what? I was able to, with the help of one of my co-agents, I work internationally with other agencies. We had it set up in a minute. Now, the title was really catchy. You can't deny that one. But the text worked. She knew what she was writing about. So when you're writing nonfiction, is this stuff you know about? Is stuff you've lived? Is it stuff that's fascinating to you? Because maybe that's how you're going to get into it. And by your investigating and getting under the surface, it's going to come to life. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? All right. Ken, you got any uh, uh, parting words for us besides there's no rules? <laughs> I'm going to say again, there are no rules. Please write what you're passionate about. If you don't have passion, and that sometimes you get an idea, and you know you think I want to write about this or that, start digging in your head, and start digging in in uh, when you're out researching it, the characters um, or whoever, uh, go for it. I, I'm going to say it again. I think one of the best notes I can say to you is write about those things you're afraid to write about. Write about those things that you're afraid to put on paper because people are going to think you're weird or, or strange or a pervert. Not a pervert. There's no perverts in the world other than the perverts. Uh, but meaning, meaning don't be afraid. Put it down on paper. I, I'm going to again say, 
write little short stories. A short story can be a paragraph or 20 pages about each of your characters, about everything you want to write about, about the story you think you want to write about. In other words, dissect it and become intimate with it. That's what I'm going to personally respond to if you've been successful in your, in your writing. And the business side, all this stuff of finding an agent and finding a publishing house that will you know, take you on or someone who's going to say, wow, that's a great book. I've set books up um, in film and television before uh, they've been published because they're so good. Uh, there's a reason that the publishing house took it on and the, and the film and TV worlds and stage. I've, I've had an opera come from my company, from one of my agents, from one of my clients. I've had a musical up in London with Cameron McIntosh. If you don't know who he is, he's the producer of Cats, Les Miserables, Miss Saigon, Phantom of the Opera. And this was the, the uh, ex, uh, I'm suddenly drawing a blank. Uh, it was a John Updike thing. I represented Updike for 32 years. Uh, the Witches of Eastwick, which became a very successful movie based on his book. And then I got a call from Cameron who said, I have the boys who want to adapt it as a musical and I'm going to fund it. And that's because the material, not everybody is an uptight. By the way, he had three desks. This is a challenge to you. One where he wrote his novels, one where he wrote his nonfiction, and one where he wrote his articles. And he knew where to sit down and how to do that. But it's just, it takes years to become a good writer. And don't be frustrated when you're starting. When you, maybe some of you have written two or three novels or two or three nonfiction books. It takes time. I found that very often it's the second or third or the fifth book, which is when a writer has figured out how they can be a writer and they feel the, the fluidity of starting on page one. There's, a, there's also a, a thing about writing. Uh, you've come to the end of a chapter. It's time for dinner. Uh, what you do is you write the first sentence or two or three of the next chapter you want to write. So when you sit down the next day, and that's again not being a, a, a Sunday writer, a weekend writer, you know where to start. And it kicks you into your passion. And you maybe overnight, like the lady was saying, I have these these images, these ideas, wonderful, go with them, go with them, write poetry, write a paragraph, write a page and see what you have. Just go with it. Don't, don't be afraid of yourself. How's that? Thank you. And thanks. Thanks so much for joining us again. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, we're all going to hang out here and eat snacks and everything. We wish you were here with us. But uh, those of you at home, thanks for joining us on Zoom as well. And we hope to see you here next month on Valentine's Day. Thanks, Ken. I'm, I'm jealous of your snacks. I would really love a good cheeseburger, medium rare, real serious meat, uh, Swiss cheese, lots of grilled onions and Thousand Island dressing. Thanks everybody. <laughs>